Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where, wow, what a difference a week makes. It has truly been an incredible week. Last week, one week ago, Dwayne Johnson was on top of the world, ma, having secured Henry Cavill's Superman cameo and getting that aggressive online fan base to not only back his movie, Black Adam, but to back him personally. He was the savior who had who had done the impossible. Uh, Hollywood Reporter, uh, the Monday before Black Adam's release, ran a big splash, that seems so long ago, ran a big splashy article about how James Gunn and Dwayne Johnson were battling it out for a land grab over at DC, which means trying to lock down projects and characters. But now, one week later, James Gunn and Peter Safran have all the land as the new heads of DC Studios, now blatantly named after Marvel Studios. That's crazy to me. With Warner Brothers convinced that they have their new Kevin Feige, similar to how they felt they were the big winners when they got Joss Whedon to reshape Justice League, or when they first brought over Gunn to take over the Suicide Squad, only for that film to, let's, let's cut the difference and say, noticeably underperform. So we might be like, why are we even bringing this up in a discussion about Black Adam and Dwayne Johnson? Well, that's because this is who Dwayne Johnson has lost to. And Dwayne Johnson ain't used to losing, period, much less to these two. In fact, almost a week after the Gun Safran announcement, despite people from his team congratulating the duo, Dwayne Johnson has yet to even comment on it, much less congratulate them himself, even though he's working directly in the DC space and is huge on social media and extremely engaged. He's been tweeting and posting, just not about that. He's still focused on making Black Adam a hit. He's just keeping eyes forward and trying to hold his head high about the success of that film. And it's not going so great. Uh, And also, he's trying to also keep reminding everybody that he brought back Henry Cavill, whose whose career, for better or worse, Dwayne Johnson and his company, which Danny Garcia is a part of and she uh, manages Henry Cavill, are deeply invested in. But as I've said many times before, Dwayne Johnson is in the Dwayne Johnson business and he brought, brought back Henry Cavill to help Dwayne Johnson. Yet, where is the supposed Henry Cavill boost to the box office? Despite Henry Cavill's rabid online fandom, who said they would kill this movie if he wasn't in it, have not shown up to support it. In fact, they rarely show up for any of Henry Cavill's actual films or shows. The Witcher is really Henry Cavill's own hit that he can call his own, and he just walked away from it. Black Adam is performing exactly on par with Hobbs and Shaw, exactly. And when asked how I thought Black Adam would perform for the past few weeks, I've consistently said I felt it would perform on the level of Hobbs and Shaw. And it certainly is, which means it's going to rely heavily on overseas box office, where Hobbs and Shaw did almost 80% of its business. That's highly unusual. Usually the split is 60 to 40% uh, to international versus domestic. Uh, Thankfully, Black Adam seems, this is fascinating, seems to have secured a China release date of November 11th, where Hobbs and Shaw pulled in a whopping 200 million. But no major trade has confirmed that China release date, and the few articles that have talked about it are basing their reporting on a tweet from a random unverified Snyder Stan account with a Russian name. But speaking of social media, Birds of Prey, the Snyder Cut, Black Adam with Henry Cavill, How many times is Warner Brothers going to follow the Twitter hype only to have that supposed fan base ghost them again and again when it comes time to actually click or buy a ticket? It's like when Sony re-released Morbius because Morbin Time was popular on social media. Speaking of hype, so far Dwayne Johnson, despite impressive Herculean efforts, has not been able to hype his own DC success into existence just yet. We'll see if that China release date actually materializes. Dwayne Johnson better hope it does and that they like the movie. Although truth be told, China hasn't significantly boosted anyone, any Hollywood movie for years now. And the days of it being, uh, you know, a, 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 a significant boost for Hollywood blockbusters might just be over. As, I mean, I don't even think, you know, Mar- Marvel or Disney movies, well, Marvel in particular, haven't opened there since the announcement of Shang-Chi. Fascinatingly. All right, so as for the rest, they really, you know, that was supposed to bring China further into the MCU, and it has made them enemies, it seems. 
As to the rest of the box office, thanks to the incredibly low bar that is now their careers, George Clooney and Julia Roberts are likely thrilled with their 39% drop in week two, even though the overall numbers for Ticket to Paradise are strikingly low. You would think Clooney and Roberts, certainly in their heyday, would have delivered. They, they, should, be, they should be at 100 million by now. And, you know, uh, Black Adam should have opened at 100 million if things were performing as they're supposed to. Um, still, again, this is great advertising for Ticket to Paradise's eventual, eventual digital and streaming run on Peacock. People will be like, oh yeah, people seem to like that movie. It did okay. Let's watch it. Uh, um, so, and also, as Paramount continues to smile at the box office, the little horror movie that could is almost at the century mark. They clearly won Halloween this year. As Halloween ends, continues to struggle, at least at the box office. Who knows how it's doing on Peacock? And Pray for the Devil opened with a disturbed whimper rather than a ghastly scream. 2022 overall has been a fantastic year for Paramount at the box office, and it looks like they're going to finish pretty strong, too. Let's see if they can keep it up in 2023. Terrifier 2, by the way, is the runner-up for Halloween winners this year, having been in the top 10 for almost an entire month now and close to 10 million. Again, for a small little indie horror film, that's incredible, not even from a major distributor. Awards contender Till went wide this weekend and landed at a respectable position in the top 10, yet Tar, for all its hype, speaking of hype, interesting, you know, uh, you know what's, Hollywood has long relied on hype to tell them what is going to be successful in advance, but it seems like social media is beginning to distort that, uh, and the media maybe perhaps overall. But Tar was the hot awards movie, yet it's barely in the top 10 as it went semi-wide this weekend. Now, it might be in less theaters than Till, but its per-screen average, once mighty when it first opened, is now pretty low, too. If things were good, if it was just the theater count, it would have a much stronger per-theater average. Speaking of per-theater averages, Armageddon Times is pretty weak and might be DOA for the awards season, uh, unable to compete with the very similar The Fablemans from Spielberg. These are two very similar movies. And one's from Steven Spielberg. That's uh, The Fablemans, of course, is already a huge awards frontrunner. It's, if not the awards frontrunner. Another awards frontrunner is The Banshees of Inisherin, uh, and that's expanding slow and steady. With genuine heat on Colin Farrell for his first Oscar nom, he's never been nominated, and maybe even a win right away. Interestingly, it was also Martin McDonough who got him his Golden Globe for In Bruges. Speaking, speaking of excellent director-actor uh, partnerships, which we often discuss. Uh, over in streaming, two very different Halloween projects shined over on Nielsen. With Dahmer's audience continuing to grow to monstrous heights, now not only the second biggest English language hit of all time for Netflix after Stranger Things, but now also the biggest hit of Ryan Murphy's career, which is formidable. And then Hocus Pocus 2 over on Disney Plus is the best opening ever for a movie on the streaming ser on any on any on any streaming service that Nielsen has monitored. It even topped Encanto. That's incredible. And this was just its early October debut. Surely it has been doing big numbers all month. I know that my parents and family have been saving it for tomorrow, for Halloween. Have you watched Hocus Pocus 2 yet? Have you watched it multiple times? Or are you saving it for tomorrow? The first Hocus Pocus also made it into the overall chart, as did Netflix's Lou. And as you might recall, for the past few weeks, it's been hard for any movie to make it into the overall chart, much less three of them. Rings of Power and House of the Dragon to continue to be neck and neck, but again, this doesn't include the HBO viewership for House of the Dragon. Also, we're not looking at international, so, you know, Rings of Power could be quite big uh, overseas, uh, so it's really kind of hard to get a read on these two. But considering how much more expensive Rings of Power uh, is, uh, it shouldn't be so close. Uh, over on the originals chart, Andor is holding steady at number six in its second week. Another middle-of-the-pack Star Wars show like Obi-Wan was. Still not bad. I'm happy for that, actually, because the show, as it goes along, I've seen through episode 10 now because I got some advanced screeners the other day. Quite good. It really was sent to die going up against Rings of Power and House of the Dragon. A, a real shame. Also, very not good start. Uh, but it's really, really a, a sensational show. They're already saying, oh yeah, we're doing one more season, but we're not going to do a third. So that's not great. But it's better than She-Hulk! She-Hulk managed to pop back into the top 10. It was out of the originals chart overall last week. It's back at the bottom with, number, with episode 7. 
Now, this is also interesting. We'll see how the show does with its final two Daredevil episodes. And we'll see, compared to Cavill, if Charlie Cox's fandom delivers a boost. That, again, that's really going to be interesting because it's very similar. It's just a cameo. It's a character fans really wanted to see come back. Will the boost be there? And on the movies chart, Warner Brothers Discovery's decision to go digital first, you know, like on iTunes and uh, Voodoo and uh, you know, Fandango, wherever you can purchase and rent digital movies instead of a day and date debut on HBO Max. Well, that's continuing to have these new movies when they eventually do get to HBO Max, only debut in the middle of the pack. Hopefully it's worth it for the di digital revenue that they're supposedly getting, that they're not reporting. So, you know, only Zazzy knows. He's dug himself such a deep hole of debt, though. I can't be, uh, you know, but I guess every bit helps. Over on Netflix for just last week, Paul Feig can breathe a sigh of relief that his supposed comeback movie, The School for Good and Evil, opened at number, number one. It's not a momentous number one, but number one is number one. While The Curse of Bridge Hollow is still in second place in its second week, a very solid performer. I like that movie, as I told you, and this looks like we might get that sequel or Christmas version that they heavily tease. So that's great. New movie The Stranger did not make a big impression. As for shows, The Watcher continues to be huge as well, giving Ryan Murphy back-to-back -back hits. I finished The Watcher uh, just the other day. I know a number of people have said the ending is very disappointing, but I actually thought it was excellent. It was, wasn't too gory. I thought it was a really good story. I really liked it all the way through. I thought it was an excellent miniseries. Uh, and Murphy stole Mike Flanagan's thunder this Halloween season. It's, get, it's competitive out there. It's competitive. On iTunes, the big Halloween winner, because it's Halloween weekend, is Barbarian, which interestingly, because it's a Disney Fox movie, is available on both digital, like this, but also HBO Max to stream. When Nielsen catches up, you know, Nielsen's always a couple of weeks behind, it'll be interesting to see how ba Barbarian did for the Warner Brothers Discovery service. If you didn't see Barbarian in theaters and you watched it when it came out, where did you watch it? Did you get it on digital or did you stream it on HBO Max? And after a solid two weeks towards the top of the top 10, Bros is slipping out, uh, where some of, those other re some of these other recent theatrical releases that you can see here, here have been in the top 10 for months and are still here. This coming weekend in theaters, Armageddon time goes wide, and that's it, as nobody wants to open right before Juggernaut Black Panther 2. So that leaves it all for Black Adam for its last weekend before Black Panther 2. Hobson Shaw fell another 44% in its third weekend, and we'll see how Black Adam fares. Interestingly, the Gun Saffron announcement might have clipped fans' excitement for Black Adam. So how do you feel after the Gun Saffron announcement? I mean, did it take away any of your interest for Black Adam? Because, you know, they're obviously going to go in the gun direction, not the Dwayne Johnson direction. Fascinating. Because, you know, they, like, they not only sacrificed their relationship with Dwayne Johnson, but his own movie. It's super busy on streaming this week, though. Wow. With films on Wednesday, Peacock has political thriller, thriller The Independent with John Cena and Succession's Brian Cox, which reminds you that Brian Cox slums, slummed quite a bit in the rest of his career before, you know, Succession. Uh, he made some good movies, too. I'm not saying he always slummed, but he slummed a lot. Uh, then on Friday, Netflix drops Enola Holmes 2, which, of course, stars Henry Cavill. I hear they're not too happy with him because he basically just completely torpedoed the, the, uh, the Witcher for them. Uh, so that's interesting. I know there's been rumors that maybe he... There are so many rumors around Henry Cavill. I think it's crazy. You guys are like, he's going to be uh, Hyperion and Marvel, and he's going to be Bond and Superman all at the same time. And it's like, that would never happen. Uh, but some of you honestly believe that it will. Uh, then My Policeman debuts on Prime Video, and Daniel Radcliffe finally will debut as Weird Al Yankovic uh, on Roku. By the way, they've, they've, for a while, they, that was getting a lot of media attention, but it seems to have gone silent right before it releases. Then with series, ooh, The White Lotus takes uh, the baton from House of the Dragon for HBO Sunday nights. Tonight, it's, it starts tonight. Uh, the ne it's not, don't call it a season because it's, uh, it's, it's not a show. Uh, you know, it's not a series. That's how it competes in the miniseries section. So I guess The White Lotus round two, that's such a cheat. All right, so anyway, while on Thursday, Titans is back with a two-episode premiere and Netflix has the comedy blockbuster ironically celebrating the very company that they put out of business. <laughs> what a boss move. 
And on Friday, wow, Manifest is finally back. The sensation, the, well, the network show that Netflix turned into a sensation has a new season four, which is exclusive to Netflix. And again, that drops on Friday. And the Mosquito Coast comes back finally to Apple TV. I love that show. That'll be a week to week. Um, but I just thought Mosquito Coast, if you're looking for something to watch, Mosquito Coast season one was absolutely incredible. And I'm so happy the show has returned. Fen- phenomenal television. And that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of the latest uh, news on Black Adam's box office and the situation with DC leadership in the wake of it? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.